The last Monday of May is a day to remember and honor those who have died while serving our country's armed forces. It has also become the unofficial launch for the summer vacation season. It's a season when we gather friends and grill hot dogs and hamburgers. It sets off a season of community festivals like our strawberry festival. And in northern climes, it's the beginning of the planting season. Now I know here in southern Maryland, the frost has generally passed by April. But in the north, people wait until after Memorial Day to put their tender plants into the ground. Our new house came with septic issues. And the installation of our new septic system has left us with an uneven yard and four huge, unsightly green septic lids and several vents. The warmer weather and the sunnier days have inspired Frank and I to plan a garden that will incorporate and disguise the septic system. Recent quotes from landscapers suggest that this could be an expensive and laborious task, sending us back to the drawing board to consider what we really want. Now, what I really want is a glorious yard filled with herbs and vegetables and trees and shrubs and bursting with color. I want to sip my coffee in the cool of the morning and be inspired by God's creation. I want our garden to be a happy place where children play and memories are made. That's a lovely dream. It's easy to dream about what we want because we all want to be happy and carefree. So maybe a better question would be, what are we willing to struggle for? What pain are we willing to endure for the things that we really want in life? Think about it. How much digging and planting and weeding and grass cutting, leaf raking, how much sweat and toil are we willing to invest in a garden? Same question can be translated to any other area of our life. For example, we all want an amazing employment opportunity that will provide us financial independence. But are we willing to do the grunt work that comes first? Are we willing to go to that entry level job? Or have a long commute? Work overtime hours? Deal with all that obnoxious paperwork and office politics? We all want loving relationships, but are we willing to endure the hard conversations and awkward silences, the emotional upsets and sacrificial compromises in order to nurture one another? You know, one of my parents' friends divorced his first wife, re-entered the dating scene, found a new partner, and in the end, he said if he had invested as much time and energy with his first wife that he had in finding a new partner, there wouldn't have been a divorce in the first place. A good relationship doesn't develop solely from your happiness. It blossoms when both persons are willing to love and support the other first and unconditionally. So, how does this sacrifice connect to this morning's scripture? What Jesus wanted was for us to realize that God's kingdom had already begun on earth at his time. He wanted people to understand that God could forgive them for hurting others. He wanted them to feel connected to God so that they could extend that same sort of forgiveness to family and friends, neighbors, nations, and even their enemies. Luke gave us a full gospel of account of what all of that Jesus did and taught. And now he's writing a second book about how the Holy Spirit works through a community of believers to form the church. He starts with their commissioning. So we back up just a little bit before today's reading, and we begin at verse 4. It reads, while they were eating together, Jesus ordered them to return to Jerusalem and wait to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
Then in response, his disciples asked if Jesus was going to restore the kingdom of Israel right now. They had listened to all of Jesus' teaching about equality and inclusion and equal opportunity for everyone, about sacrifice, forgiveness, and the hard work of loving another, and they wanted to know, they still wanted to know if superhero Jesus was going to save the day and make their lives easy and happy. Jesus answered, God's timing is up to God. The Holy Spirit is going to work with you. You are going to share the teachings about God's kingdom. From Jerusalem, that, that was the center of religious worship in those days, to Judea, another place that they felt relatively comfortable preaching and teaching, to Samaria, a place outside of their comfort zone, and to the ends of the earth, places beyond their imagination where they never even thought of going before. And then, while they were watching, he was lifted up beyond the clouds, beyond their sight, just, just gone. And they stood there, staring. Two men in white, that is Luke's code for two messengers from God, blasted them out of their reverie by asking, why are you just standing around staring? The group returned to the upper room where they had been staying. There were 11 named male disciples, the women who followed Jesus and his family, and they all entered a period of eager, active waiting. The NRSV Bible, your pew Bible, says that they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together. The Common English Bible, one of the newer releases, says they were united in their devotion to prayer. The King James Version noted that they continued with one, one accord in prayer. The Amplified Bible says all of these with one mind and one purpose were continually devoting themselves to prayer. The point is first that they obeyed Jesus. They returned to Jerusalem to wait until they had received the power of the Holy Spirit. Waiting is hard work. We Americans are people of action. We are in a culture of independence and anxiety. We tend to rush off to the next big thing or seek out people who appear to have the right techniques to generate success rather than doing the hard work of discernment and opening ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Also, through engaged, prayerful waiting, they became united in purpose. They just didn't run off in multiple directions. They were united in mind and purpose. They were of one accord. They laid a foundation to become a community of believers. It was like they were sent back to the drawing board to consider the costs and their role in the kingdom of God. Can you imagine the impact of this experience? Realizing that they are going to be the teachers and the workers for the kingdom? If they had not chosen to endure the pain, we wouldn't have a community of believers today. We wouldn't have a church. Instead, they endured. In fact, they were devoted, and they strove for unity, and they prayed constantly. They were continually opening themselves to God's Spirit. We're going to celebrate the gift of God's Spirit next week during Pentecost. And yet, the question of cost is still a good one. What pain are you willing to endure for God's kingdom? We all want to live in a peaceful land where everyone has enough bread for the day, where we all consider ourselves and each other children of God. But are we willing to do the hard work? 
The leaders of Davisonville United Methodist Church began this year with prayer and discernment, and they became united in purpose. Smaller groups continue to meet and pray and to listen for our community's way forward. We are dedicated to being open to the Spirit so that God's kingdom can grow and blossom here. God's message of equality, inclusion, forgiveness, and healing love is the faith that we strive to share. So I am grateful for those who toiled and sweated through the Strawberry Festival so that we have the resources to teach and preach and send others into service. Our congregation's resources allow us to answer the needs of the most vulnerable in our community through programs like the breakfast sharing program or by keeping the lights on with BG&E supplements or by, by preventing families from being evicted from their homes. Saturday's income supports both the youth missions in Pennsylvania where homes will be repaired and the Tongues of Fire local missions and home repairs. I am grateful for our community connections like the Wason family. I am grateful for their donation of a shed that will protect our outdoor worship equipment because worship helps people be transformed by God's presence. I am grateful for all the people who have taken on leadership roles so that we can operate well as a church and be the body of Christ to our neighbors, to each person who has committed to endure so that others can seal, see and feel the kingdom of God. Thank you. Amen.